With that, I will move on to our next introducer, which is Chrissy Scherer from ABM. Thank you so much, Dr. Perrigan, and thank you, Dr. Lane and Alec. Um, they made it very easy for this transition in my introduction to our next speaker. Uh, just to give you a little footnote on ABM, my name is Chrissy Sheriff. I am the account, account executive for ABM on the Central Virginia side. Um, and coming off of that wonderful presentation, uh, ABM is a facilities services organization nationwide over 100 years old. Facility services, what we do on the energy services side is identify and fund and implement energy efficiency improvements. So those projects that are much needed just to what Dr. Lane was talking about, that's where we come into play. That's where we come in to help you. Um, so we fund those improvements that you need to your HVAC, your lighting, whatever it may be. We're the ones finding that savings through those energy conservation implementations. So our recent work is with school systems, local governments, and we leverage savings from the energy conservation savings from those improvements to fund the improvements themselves. Add to that, we leverage any stimulus funds, grants that we can gain for you, rebates that are coming available for some of these more loftier, exciting projects like EV charging stations, fleet electrification that addresses those school bus problems that we're looking at in our CIP items. That's where we can come in. We look at all of these different areas within your budget that you have currently locked down and we'll create cash flow for you so that you can holistically and strategically improve the learning environment and experience for everybody. So we'll bring in all these solutions for you and happy to help with you. But more importantly, in getting to our next speaker, I have the privilege and honor of introducing Mary, Mary Filardo. She's an executive director of the 21st Century Fund. She founded it, the, the Rebuild America School Infrastructure Coalition. She's a leader in the national authority and advocate for improving equity, efficiency, and quality of public school buildings and protocols and grounds. She's researched and written extensively on public school facility policy and spending. She's worked with local and state communities and officials on effective long range facilities master planning, facility data, and management and improved oversight and accountability for capital programs. She comes with a BA in philosophy and mathematics from St. John's College, a master's in public policy from the University of Maryland, and is a, 19, and a 79 Truman Scholar from the District of Columbia. Very impressive background and, and resume, I might say. And without further ado, Mary, the screen is yours. So I'm, I'm gonna talk about the politics of this situation here that we all are in, um, but First, we're gonna spend a little bit of time, and I thought Dr. Lane did a, a, a great job with sort of a very quick overview of what, what does it look like when you've got um, uh, challenges with your school facilities. So, you know, part of the problem is we kind of know it when we see it, right? Like there, there's a problem here. You got a sinkhole there. This is a, a school that actually we, um, project that we worked on, um, and we know this is a school with problems. Uh, this is what this school looks like now. It's been fully modernized. And, and you walk into this classroom and you, you, you know you've got a great, <laughs> a great public school, right? Um, so uh, wh what do the numbers look like, right? So what are uh, numbers on standards for adequacy, factors to understand equity, and, and how do we understand, you know, how money can tell us about quality condition and utilization and, and how they might interact. So one of the challenges that we have is that uh, frankly doing facilities assessments is uh, on an engineering basis is expensive, it's time consuming, but there are some good standard um, uh, based evaluations for adequacy. And, and what's here is a, a, a graphic that shows you how to use your current replacement values towards understanding whether or not you are funding your facilities in an adequate way. It doesn't, it won't give you a plan, won't tell you your cash flow, but it will give you an idea whether or not you've been budgeting um, and spending appropriately. So this is 3% of your current replacement value for maintenance and operations, 2% for replacing you know, your HVAC, your roofs, your windows, your 
your floors, your carpeting, anything that wears out. And as we know, it's just about everything wears out eventually. Um, and then we, working with state facility officials, we realized that you know the school buildings, and you heard it from the architects who, who described it so well, that the work changes and the buildings need to change. They need to change to address educational change, issues of uh, climate and weather, issues of uh, community use, uh, safety and security. There's a lot of ways that we have to be able to make alterations to buildings that are 50 years old in order to make sure that they're appropriate. So, so this is a, a little cheat sheet and you again you heard Dr. Lane talk a little bit about it in terms of the CRV but he was only looking at schools that were um, I think 50 years or older but in fact this applies to, to all schools. Uh, the uh, and th this is these are the data for Virginia and these are from um, what the districts reported from FY09 to 2018. So on average over that 10 year period School districts in Virginia spend about 800 million a year on school facilities. This is throughout the state. Now, here's, here's the rub. According to the standards, this is a 4% current replacement value, that would be depreciating them over 25 years, should be spending about two and a half billion over that period. So you see that that's an enormous gap. Now there's there's some flexibility in that because if you uh, anyway, I'm not, I won't go into that, but you can, you can see how this is not a, a fixed number, but this is a big number. Um, and uh, that's on the capital side. So that's your renewals, your alterations. But on the M&O side, there's also a challenge here. The three-year average spending for maintenance and operation of plant was about $1.4 billion. And this is the annual average over three years. Now, what, according to the standard, what district should be spending is 1.9 billion. So here again, there's a gap. And what we know is that if you're not doing your preventive maintenance, if you're not doing your routine maintenance, things deteriorate faster. So this, this little back of the envelope thing, you can do it at your district level, you can do it at a school level. And here, here's just a quick example, because it's something that I think everybody ought to know how to do, because you can play with the factors. If, if $321 is in what it costs for new construction, you use whatever your number is for new construction in your district or for your school. You take the square footages of your, of your school. In this case, I just made it easy. So it's 100,000 gross square feet. Now, what you also need to know, however, is how much have you spent um, on your school over time, right? So this, I'm just saying, okay, let's say we spent $350,000 on this school um, annual average over the last 10 years. But actually, based on this uh, process, it should have been spending a million two a year. That's a, a gap of um, $934,000. So now if we said it was a 3% CRV, remember I mentioned the 3% or 4%, your gap would be 613,000 a year. And part of what this can do is just help you get a, a kind of a quick notion of, you know, how, how big a hill you're trying to climb. Um, so whether or not you've got adequate funding, you know, particularly looking at it from a state level is different than whether or not your funding is equitable. And so, you know, what are the factors that we can look at to try to understand equity? So what I'm going to do is walk you through a, a school construction capital outlay, which is reported by the district, maintenance and operations reported by the district, the level of state funding that the districts are reporting, how much debt each district is carrying, and how much interest they're, they're paying. So what this is, is what we did is we analyzed the district data by the percent of free and reduced lunch kids in the district. And so, and, and, I, and I'd love for, or, you know, Keith or someone to just interrupt me um, if, if there's something that I, that I need to clarify, because I, I live in these numbers. And so it's, it's, uh, it, it's easy for me to, um, you know, kind of think that, oh, it's obvious, right? <laughs> but in, e in each of these charts, 
what I'm showing here is Virginia totals and averages, right? And then the, the in this case, the 173 schools that are um, in zero to 25% pre reduced lunch. Um, and what, what I thought was important to see is that you know, the kids and the number of schools are not equally divided into these four quartiles. Um, so I've left that here. But in, in this case, uh, I thought an interesting uh, statistic is what percent of your operating dollars, your total operating expenditures, not your budgeted one, these are actual expenditures, did you spend on maintenance and operational plant? So in the wealthiest districts, it was 9.4. In the poorer districts, it was 9.7. And this is what it works out to be on a per student basis. So you can see there's a little bit of a premium here uh, for the poorer districts in terms of what, what they're spending on maintenance and operation of plant. And it, as you can see, all of this data is from the National Center for Education Statistics. And the maintenance of operation of plant is utilities, cleaning, security, and routine and preventive maintenance and repair. So it's none of your, no capital projects. Um, then we were interested, well, you know, so how much by free and reduced lunch, you know, in the districts, how much school construction capital outlay have we seen? So again, the state total was about $8 billion over this 10 year period. And this is in all in 2020 dollars, okay? And so uh, in the wealthiest districts, there was about 3,400 a student, but about 2 million a school. And th these are interesting distinctions. So uh, I'd be cu curious to see how folks uh, read and understand this. This is 3.2 million a school, but notice in this, <laughs> this very large group of 238,000 kids, it was only 900,000 a school. Uh, now, it, it, it actually doesn't look as bad at 2,147 a student, but I suspect that's because of the, the size of the enrollment as it relates to the, the school buildings. But here you can see too that the spending per school 1.8 million, 3,900 a, a student, but again, you have to look at this together with its adequacy as, as well as its equity. So these are, these are numbers which you, is important to be come familiar with in order to understand and, and discuss equity within your state. The other question that's an equity question is, well, what has the state done to help, right? Um, Virginia it is, is not among the stellar uh, helpers, I have to, have to say. Um, on average, about 18 to 20% uh, is what the states have paid for school construction. Virginia, over these last 10 years, has been about half that. As Dr. Lane said, it looks like it may be uh, pushing up. And certainly, I think from listening to your legislators, um, uh, they should be working hard to, to get that up even higher. Um, so again, what we have here, you can see that the you know, it looks like a fairly equitable distribution, except that the, the very poorest schools have had not even the average in terms of state health for their um, school facilities. And I would argue that this is a, a major equity uh, problem that the uh, state has that, that can be remedied and is likely to be largely the small and, and rural schools in this category. Um, the other thing that, that, you know, we find interesting is, you know, what, what can be done, right? Or not what can be, but the, the, the debt, I'm sorry. One of the things that we're hearing from Washington right now is, well, how are you going to pay for it? How are you going to pay for it? It's like they want a small infrastructure bill because they don't want to pay for it. Well, the reality is that this stuff is not free and uh, it, we're going to have to pay for it. So right now, what we're seeing is that at the end of fiscal year 2018, and it was interesting because Dr. Lane had a slightly lower number, I think, than, than is reported here, but it's 8.3 billion in uh, debt. And what that means on average is that out of the school district operating budget, so you're spending almost $2, $250 a student 
paying interest. It was interest only, not not the principal. Um, in the uh, and and again, you can see the distribution of the debt load with a, a far lower debt load in the poorest districts, which would make sense because they, you know, if, if you're poor, you it's hard it's hard to borrow. So so an, another indicator of you know sort of effort and ability related to equity is going to be looking at debt um, and then this is really where you know well, we've got a, an adequacy challenge and we have an equity challenge and and virginia is not unique in this way at all um, and so we're the first thing, which, which you can see, is you have to document your facilities. You have to have good data on your facilities. You've got to have your inventory. You have to know your size. Some, some measure of condition. I mean, they don't have to be expensive you know, assessments necessarily, but you need to know something about the condition of your buildings. You have to have some way to evaluate the design, the utilization, even, even issues of location. You know, how far are kids traveling to get to schools? I, I tend to be a, a strong proponent of keeping schools, even small schools open um, because we need them and kids shouldn't be riding an hour and a half on a bus. Um, and uh, those communities, partly why they're losing population is there hasn't been investment in their, in their school infrastructure and to keep the young families. So, so there, there's complicated things going on in school schools um, and we need the data to help everyone understand it and discuss it. So the cost, some of the other data, obviously cost for operations, management, capital projects, your data needs to be school specific and you should have at least 10 years of data. And there, there is a, a, a guide that actually I helped write for that the National Center for Education Statistics makes available for local and state um, facilities information systems. But the other thing that you have to do, and sometimes school districts are a little, little concerned about it, is you've got to share the data with your public. I know it feels like dirty laundry, like it's your fault, but it's not. The crumbling of schools takes decades, but if you don't sound the alarm, it is your fault. And there's got to be the data, but also pictures, stories, the complexities. These need to be a part of the public, in the public domain, something that the public is grappling with. Um, the, this data and information needs to be available to officials. You need to testify at hearings, the public as well as the officials. You have to write a report. I mean, I, I, it's a pain in the neck, but you, you got to write it down. You have to get leadership to focus on this and, you know, a, a official roundtables, all kinds of things. I mean, I think what, you're, you, what you've done today is, is really fantastic. But we know that this needs to happen all over the state, frankly, all over the country. The other thing is plan, plan, plan. And you and don't wait for funding to plan for what you need. I know it, you know, people will say it's pie in the sky. Oh, this is like, you know, impossible. You know, why are you doing this? But it's so important to engage the community and for the community to take ownership of of the vision of the plan in order to move it forward. Um, and, and with that engagement, you know, it's going to be the, the, the public that's going to come up with the advocacy for the funding, for the equity, for the management, for the accountability. And, and the officials in the school districts and in the legislature and in the county councils they're going to have to come up with the budgets, the policies, the standards, and the official plans. But it's going to be a really uh, important um, uh, lift uh, of, of community and uh, district advocacy together. So you know, part of what is important to appreciate, I, I believe <laughs> that school facilities are political, but they're legitimately political. And so it, it shouldn't be like, oh, you know, we shouldn't politicize this. No, it is political, but we want to constrain the politics with good information, with good engagement. So we, we, we need to know how are districts, states, the nation, how are we going to pay for it? 
which districts, which schools, which communities will get the funds we raise? Who decides who gets what? Where's the accountability for facilities decisions? What about the management of our school buildings and our school facilities? And, and, and how are we really gonna do this planning? So one of the things I just wanna take a second and, and tell me Keith, if, if I'm, I'm not actually keeping track of time, which I should be. Um, Great, Mary, thanks, keep it up. Okay, so is uh, one of the things that, my, my background is as a parent that got into um, uh, trying to make her kids' schools better in the District of Columbia and then have gone on to sort of make this my, my life's work. But as I told Keith, my dad was a superintendent in rural Illinois and then in Dover, Delaware. So I, I kind of grew up around um, school facilities. And, and um, one of the things that we did after working locally and working with our National Council of, um, on School Facilities, a really great group of state facility directors, we realized that we had to get together at the national level. And so we created um, the Rebuild America School Infrastructure Coalition called BASIC. And this coalition is working to um, uh, get federal funds for um, our K-12 facilities. And it, it's a really important time right now. I have to tell you, they're debating infrastructure all the time and never have school facilities been in the Republican uh, infrastructure uh, plan. They just have not been there. And we, we have talked to with our state officials, we've talked to many, many senators on both sides and they're sympathetic, but they do not want to let it in. And I think we have, we have got to overcome that. You know, we know that facilities is a nonpartisan issue in our local communities. It should be a bipartisan issue in Congress. So um, I, I'm making a plug here, Keith, <laughs> that whatever folks can do to um, communicate with their uh, senators to get them to, to consider schools and the infrastructure package, that that would be great. The other thing is that uh, it is in uh, the president's budget for his FY22, but the authorizing legislation isn't passed. So we, we have a ways to go, and I would invite you to go to uh, this website, buildusschools.org, and you can learn about uh, some of what this coalition is doing and you can also join it. So uh, with that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna close Keith and you can, can uh, you know, take us to the next, the next level. Well, Mary, actually, if you don't mind, I would like to ask a couple questions based on that last slide, if you don't mind. Not at all. So um, it's my understanding that when President Biden put out his initial infrastructure plan, there was a hundred billion dollars in school infrastructure money set aside partially for building and partially for, for loans. And right. then the Republicans came out and it did not include it. And then his, re, his, his second issue also did not include school infrastructure. Is that correct? Well, it, it, of course, it's a, little, it's a little hard to tell because they've been negotiating uh, numbers without specifics. And so it's our understanding that the president has kept schools in his, uh, uh, you know, in his framework and his job, the American Jobs Plan, but it it's been because they've never gotten to agreement on on the scope of that. Um, we don't know whether or not he, he was thinking as he went down in number whether or not it was the schools going down or transportation going down or broadband or, or what it might be. So so we feel confident that that Biden is committed to uh, school infrastructure, but. Uh, we, uh, you know, as the, the amount for um, infrastructure has been, uh, you know, and will be on the table too, even in a reconciliation bill, uh, it's, it's pretty unclear what, um, what might happen with schools. And the other thing, Keith, that we know is that, you know, at ARA, you know, after the Great Recession, you know, schools were in the budget for 16 billion and that got dropped at the last minute. So, so this is why I'm I'm saying, okay, we we we've got to be banging our pans <laughs> because it's not it's not clear 
that um, that we we will uh, be strong enough to to survive the the back and forth um, you know hardball politics that takes place here in DC. And Mary, that brings up another good point. You mentioned talking to our senators and congressmen. Uh, obviously, Senator Kane is very supportive of school infrastructure, has a Rebuild America Schools uh, yep. sponsor that, yep. that he's sponsoring. Uh, other Virginia uh, uh, senators and, and congressmen are a part of that as well. The, However, in the meantime, we do have federal funds that are available to us now. And I don't know if you were on earlier when it was yep. mentioned that schools have to have their money spent by 2024, whereas localities have a date that's two years further in the future. How might we advocate with the federal government to get that same flexibilities that localities have? Because if we would get the extension to 2026, it certainly would make new school construction very feasible with our, uh, with our ESSER funds and what might come out of the state discretionary funds that'll be discussed in the special session this summer. Well, I think I think that's a very important point, and I I, I do think that the um, Cardona administration uh, would be willing to look at that and advocate uh, for whatever amendment, as well as Chairman Scott um, of the uh, Education and Labor Committee on the House side, and Senator Murray on the Senate side. I I cannot imagine that that would be a, a fix that would um, that that would work, but I have to say, you know, in looking at the ESSER funds, I know that that folks are are uh, you know appreciating the the scope of that. But when we looked at if you had 15% of those ESSER funds dedicated towards school facilities, you'd only be at about two or three percent of the need. So, so it's a it it's still a uh, I think a cri of critical importance that we get the federal infrastructure program and a 10 year um, kind of runway on rebuilding this uh, antiquated uh, infrastructure. Oh, I, I agree completely. Every penny that we can get towards this uh, important issue is, is gonna be well, much needed and well spent yeah. for sure. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, that that's awesome. Well, uh, what about do we have other folks who have questions? You, if you're in the original Zoom, you can certainly ask that question or put a question in the chat. Be happy to ask that question to Mary before we we move on. So there's a question, uh, there's a comment that says politics are at play to encourage districts to spend ESSER funds quickly before 2024. Um, so this person is skeptical that they will allow the spending timeline to be further expended in 2026. Uh, if we don't ask, the answer will definitely be no. So I think we've got to at least make that attempt because that would um, certainly for a high poverty school division like Bristol, we have um, more money receiving $16 million this year since October in federal funds. Our normal budget is only 29 million. If we can get the flexibility that we need to spend it wisely, um, we could really make an impact that is multi-generational. And so that's, that's part of the reason that we're advocating for this. And I know that many other small and rural school divisions are, are facing the same plight. Yeah, and I, I definitely, I'll take it up also with the state facility um, uh, officials because I think that they would be a great group to weigh in on that issue as well, Keith. So I, I appreciate you raising it. All right. Any other questions? Comments? All right, sounds great. Well, we have come to the end of another session. We uh, actually have a break scheduled. We um, had shortened the next session a little bit, but if everybody wants to try to be back um, by, by five after two, uh, we might get that one started a little bit early. Uh, I think there's gonna be some great information about how, how the Commonwealth Institute interprets the available funding that can, how it can be flexible. And also we'll hear from an investing group or a, a realty group that can share information about different ways that you can finance the remaining portion 
um, in some really flexible and unique ways. So we'll look forward to seeing everybody back at 2.05. Thank you.